You're listening to And hey, welcome to Books and Boba, a book club and podcast featuring books by Asian and Asian American authors. My name is Marvin Yue. And I'm Rira Yu. And this is our July 2023 mid month check in uh, where we go over the latest Asian American book and publishing news. Um, I'm going to start plugging our Patreon on the top of the show from now on. But um, as always, our podcast is supported by our listeners um, at patreon.com slash books and boba, uh, where you can join our Patreon and have access to our exclusive members only discord server, uh, where we have great conversations about all sorts of topics, books and otherwise, um, as well as access to our monthly bonus episode, Boba chats, where Rira and I chat about all sorts of non book topics, as well as answer um, listener Q and a. We really appreciate all of our patrons and hope that you will join us in supporting Books and Bulba and helping us um, expand our coverage in the world of Asian American literature, which, huh, given the past few days, man, could use some support. Uh, Rira, how have you been? It's been, it's been quite a few days. Uh, yeah, it's been a really rough week for publishing in general. There has been layoffs everywhere, but uh, especially in publishing, uh, there were... Uh, recent layoffs at uh, Penguin Random House, and we're going to get into the Ink Yard news later in our news segment. Uh, I know just now a broken news that happened was St. Charles County in Missouri. Uh, they banned library cards for teenagers. So anyone who's under the age of 17 needs a parent or guardian uh, in order to sign off on getting a library card, which is absolutely ridiculous. Like. It's been, I don't know, like, I don't want to say it's a dystopia, (laughs) but it feels like it sometimes. And at the same time, it's, like, nice to see all of the support that uh, the bookish community has been showing to authors and editors and agents. But uh, it's really hard to keep your head up. Yeah, lots happening in the world of literature. Not all good, but we have a lot to get into. So let's start off, as we always do in our mid-month episodes, with a recap of the latest Asian American publishing announcements um, that Rira compiles from um, Publishers Weekly, social media, and other sources. Uh, Rira, why don't you start us off with our first book deal? All right. Our first publishing deal is Lake Union acquired world rights to Rosa Kwan Easton's debut novel, White Mulberry. Pitched as Pachinko meets the personal librarian, the book opens in Korea in the 1930s and follows a young woman named Myung, who leaves her small village for Japan in search of a better life. But once there, she must pass as a Japanese to survive. And a publication date has not been set. Yeah, it sounds like, um, I mean, I get the Pachinko reference because it takes place in the same time period of Pachinko or of, of like parts of Pachinko, which is the... Um, imperial japanese imperial occupation of korea and like the migration of koreans to the japanese um i guess islands i think this is really interesting because um a lot of koreans did have to pretend to be japanese uh, in order to you know get better opportunities during that time and um i know that like at a certain period in time uh, a lot of um like I feel like there were there were a lot of like acts of violence towards uh Koreans in the outskirts because I remember hearing that um like when there was job scarcity uh like Japanese locals would like go around and try to like find Koreans and they would find Koreans by asking them to repeat a certain phrase and depending on your accent because um Koreans like they can't say cho like they have like some kind of um, like the, the 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 emphasis is different. So that's how they would root out the Koreans and they would uh, yeah. beat them up and kill them in the streets. So I'm like, yeah, like pretending to be Japanese during this time. Uh, it was a survival tactic, but obviously it's going to do a major, major damage to your identity as like your um, identity as a Korean. And you have have an identity crisis. So. It sounds interesting. It sounds like something I wouldn't want to read. 
yeah, I mean, more stories about periods of Asian history that aren't covered as much in like Western history books, I think is always a net positive. So I'm excited for um, Rosa's new book. Congratulations. Um, all right. Next up, Albert Whitman bought world rights to Suka's Farm, a picture book by Ginger Park and Francis Park. Set in Korea in 1941, when the country was under Japanese rule, a Korean boy steps out of his prescribed place and pushes societal boundaries by entering a farm owned by a Japanese man. The picture book will be illustrated by Tiffany Chen. Publication is slated for fall 2024. Another Japanese colonization <laughs> book uh, yeah. that is set in Korea. What but an it's a interesting book. premise for a picture book because I feel like this sounds real harrowing. <laughs> like I would be stressed out about the story if I was uh, reading it as a child. Yeah, I wonder if it's going to be uh, <laughs> if it's going to have a grim ending or <laughs> if it's going to be I don't know, like a nice Japanese man. Who knows? Uh, it's <laughs> it's a very uh, a typical topic for a picture book. Yeah. I mean, even if it was a nice Japanese man, he's still an imperialist and still like essentially a colonizer. So I don't know. Lots of interesting themes that this book can explore. I'm curious to see what direction it goes. All right. Our next book deal is Gnome Road has acquired world rights to Kai Po Che, Mini's Perfect Diamond, written by Suhasini Gupta and illustrated by Davika Oza. The picture book is about a girl who must rely on creativity, confidence, and courage to help avert an impending catastrophe while celebrating the Indian Kite Festival of Makar Sankranti. Publication is set for spring 2025. So would the perfect diamond be like the diamond shape of a kite? Yeah. Yeah, it would be a diamond shape oh, of a kite. Oh, interesting. Um, I think I've talked about this when we mentioned um, kite-related stuff book before but i don't really have many memories of like kite flying and the ones that i do have i remember being like kind of boring i mean yeah like i i know that like uh south asia and west asia they have more of a tradition when it comes to kite flying they do have festivals like the one that's mentioned in this book deal um but yeah i didn't grow up uh, (laughs) flying kites either yeah but uh, that is not to say it is not a fun thing to do for kids. Um, I can see how things fly in the air. I, I like paper airplanes. That was my paper flying in the air activity. But yeah, sounds sounds like a fun story. Congratulations to Suasini and Davika. Next up, Putnam acquired North American rights to Kill Her Twice by Stacey Lee. Set in 1930s Los Angeles. This YA murder mystery noir is about three Chinese-American sisters investigating the murder of their once childhood friend turned Hollywood starlet, even if it means going behind the scenes into a world bent on destroying Chinatown. Publication is scheduled for summer 2024. Stacey Lee, the queen of Chinese-American historical fiction. (laughs) Yeah, love a good pre-war LA setting too. This is like one of my favorite settings um, to much like um, 1920s Shanghai because there's a lot of... Lots of dapper suits, um, lots of like club scenes. Um, and it, it is a time that's ripe for noir storytelling because it's when L.A. was experiencing its boom, which means a lot of government corruption behind the scenes. Yeah, I mean, it says once childhood friend turned Hollywood starlet. I'm wondering if this friend is white or if they are Chinese. I don't know when uh, we start to get Chinese starlets in Hollywood or Chinese actors who had speaking roles, but... uh, I mean, the 30s would have been the silent era, though, right? Silent era, yeah. 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 Which means there were, there was like, you know, Anime Wong and Seshue Hayakawa. Um, So, I mean, this was a time when there were actually Asian faces on, on screen, at least, you know, in the silent era. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the history in silent era... Of, of film history has been uh, rewritten. I know that like one of the biggest silent film producers of the time was actually a woman. And like she is never mentioned in a lot of textbooks. Uh, I don't remember her name. I'm so sorry to my film professors. But a lot of history back then was rewritten to make it very white. So I'm really glad that we are uh, getting more context for that history and 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 showing like oh there were like black stuntsmen and there were also like chinese 
uh, actors who had like major roles in some of these films. Granted, they were probably villain roles, but still significant roles. Um, but congratulations to Stacy. I'm really excited to read this book as well as one of her many uh, Chinese historical, Chinese American <laughs> historical novels. We'll have to read her book one day for a book club. Yeah, I'm looking at the history, the Wikipedia, and they're saying that um, silent film started getting phased out in the early 1930s. So maybe this book um, takes place during that you know, transition time when films are crossing over. And that might be an interesting um, thing to explore too. So yeah, looking forward to um, finding out more about uh, about Stacey setting. Yeah. Our next book deal is in an exclusive submission, FSG bought an untitled debut YA novel by Sahar Jahani, a first generation Iranian American Muslim writer. This coming of age dramedy follows Sana Saidi as her world turns upside down when she decides to lean into her Muslim identity and wear a hijab on the first day of her sophomore year of high school for not entirely the right reasons. Ooh. A choice that leads her on a journey of self-discovery and uncovering decades of family secrets. Publication is set for spring 2025. I'm curious as to what is the wrong reasons for her to wear a hijab to school. I mean, it's probably similar to, let's say, the reasons why, you know, um, someone would wear like a chipao or like traditional clothing um, without understanding the context, right? Like maybe, and especially with hijab having like religious connotations, like, you know, maybe wearing it for st- style or be- wearing for the attention as opposed to like actual because of faith, right? I imagine that would be the conflict there, at least um, from the description. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, I think you're right as well. Um, I think it is a topic that we're probably not too familiar with, so it would be nice to read this book <laughs> once it comes out. Yeah. Okay, our next book deal. Uh, Green Willow Books bought Heidi Hillick's debut middle grade novel, Cincinnati Lee and the Spear of Destiny. When 12-year-old Cincinnati Lee's great-great-grandfather took an ancient idol from an archaeological dig, he unwittingly brought a curse home with it. And now Cincinnati is determined to return the idol to its rightful home if she can outwit the nefarious auction house and the crusading hobby store magnet who are after the artifact too. Publication is planned for winter 2025. This sounds like a lot of fun. It's like a... Indiana Jones style like adventure but like dealing more with the aftermath of like accidentally bringing back like something that probably doesn't actually deserve to be in the museum because it's an indigenous piece of like um, culture. Yeah I mean Heidi Halig is the author of The Girl from Everywhere and uh, the sequel The Ship Beyond Time and that's also like an adventure book where uh, you have a ship that's like slipping in and out of time in different uh, time periods of like colonization and uh, you know, you get a lot of history with it. So it seems like this is her genre mixing uh, adventure with supernatural and uh, a dash of uh, colonization history. So it sounds fun. Yeah. All right. Next up, Candlewick Press acquired world rights to Hana's Hodge by Zainab Khan. While on her first Hodge pilgrimage with her father, Hannah expects the journey to be like camping trips in her scout group, only to find it is much different than her expectations in surprising and memorable ways. The book will be illustrated by Anait Samir John. Publication is set for spring 2026. Yeah, I think this is um this will be an interesting topic for a picture book, which is like the Hajj pilgrimage, uh, which is I think the the pilgrimage to Mecca, um, that through the eyes of of a kid. Yeah, I could definitely relate to going on uh like family trips, thinking that it's gonna be like, you know, like a fun camping trip, like this book is saying, but it turns out to be like more about learning your heritage and. <laughs> culture so i feel like it is it is a very very relatable experience yeah all right next up athenium caitlin lohi books bought north american english rights to you are loved a picture book by sujan rim in which a child discovers how beloved his place on earth is as nature from winds to birds to bitty bugs embraces his very presence publication is planned for spring 2024 this sounds like it might be cute um a book about nature I mean, I can't think of anything like culturally significant to say besides like, you know, it sounds like it'll be um, 
a fun way to introduce kids to, you know, um, nature stuff. Yeah, it sounds like it's a cute book about nature. And, you know, like as someone who despises nature, maybe if you foster that love to a child at a young age, maybe they'll appreciate it more. <laughs> All right, our next book deal, Bloomsbury acquired two picture books by Korean-Australian author-illustrator Sally Sowol Han. In Tiny Wonders, a girl finds everyone is too busy to stop and look around, but comes up with a plan to share color and wonder. And in Night Song, after a big day in the noisy city, a mother and child's bus breaks down on their way home, leaving them stuck on the side of a silent country road. But when the boy ventures into a nearby field, he discovers that nature is full of wonder and music. Tiny Wonders will be published in winter 2024, and Night Song will follow in 2025. Again, nature. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, it sounds cool. Like, sounds like um, these books focus more on like juxtaposing the natural world with like urban life, right? Like people being too busy to look around, people having to work in the noisy city. And, you know, I don't think it's a coincidence that we have a lot of books teaching kids about nature because, you know, today's world is so urbanized, so globalized, so like industrialized that we should show kids that, you know, there's there's cool stuff outside of cities as well. Yeah, and I'm wondering if Night Song takes place in Australia because there are some scary things out in the in the countryside. <laughs> there are <laughs> some spiders. It doesn't and sound like a book about scary things, though. So I don't know. I know, I know. I, I kid. Um, yeah. Well, congrats to Sally on her book deals. Um, next up, Creative Company bought world rights to A Place in the World, a picture book written by Rena Singh and illustrated by Christopher Powler. In a world torn by war, a courageous refugee boy and his mother embark on a perilous journey to find a safe place in the world to rebuild their lives. Publication is scheduled for fall 2025. Yes, more children's literature on the refugee experience. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we just recently read Family Style by Tin Fam, and we have an author check com- upcoming with him um, later on um, this month. But I think... It's really cool to have children's literature and media depicting the refugee experience because, um, especially through the eyes of a child, because, you know, these stories are often told through the eyes of adults or like, say, the military. So um, something that is more on the ground level from a kid's eyes. I I think those perspectives are really, really important. And, you know, like I've always said, having that those stories in the form that's easy for kids to digest um, will just only build better humans right yeah or we can hope so all right next up bloomsbury bought at auction former political staffer strategist and activist celeste pewter's infinite sky the story of chen shi shen the scientist who took two countries into space this middle grade biography explores the life of a young chinese immigrant who arrived in the u.s in 1935 to study at mit becoming a professor at Caltech's Jet Propulsion Laboratory before anti-communist paranoia prompted the U.S. to deport him back to China. Publication is set for winter 2026. Yeah, actually not familiar with this guy. So um, excited! always excited to see like unsung heroes given the spotlight, especially unsung like Asian American, Chinese American heroes. Yeah, I feel like I've heard of him. Um, I, I think I saw like a like a comic about him on Twitter. It was like one of those uh, comics that come out in like Asian American Heritage Month. It's like, did you hear about this person who got erased (laughs) in history? And it's like, no, I have not. So it's nice that there's an actual book on it. Yeah, and the added um, dimension of him being deported back to China because of like anti-communist paranoia. I think that is, that's also a good lesson to teach like young readers about like, the things we lose if we give into like irrational fears. So um, yeah, excited to see um, his story um, get more attention. Um, Okay. Next up, Harper Collins has bought in an exclusive submission world rights to another word for neighbor written by Angela Pham Kranz and illustrated by Tai Fong. This picture book in the vein of up follows Han and his budding yet reluctant relationship with his friendly and inquisitive young neighbors. Publication is slated for winter 2025. <laughs> so Han sounds like the old man character in this book, right? Like the get off my lawn, 
um, leave me alone. Yeah, I I love it when it's a story about like a grump and a sunshine, uh, like someone who's like very happy. Uh, it's a dynamic that I absolutely adore. Yeah. All right. Next book deal. Walker Books U.S. acquired world rights to The Demon's Prince by Remy Lai. The YA graphic novel follows Langya, a royal guard who has spent 250 years in servitude as one of the five demons after being murdered by the prince he was sworn to protect. To move on to a peaceful afterlife, he has to complete one final task making that same heartless prince now reincarnated as an ordinary high schooler fall in love. The book will be illustrated by Lauren DeMaya. Publication is set for spring 2026. Man, I would not want to be reincarnated as an ordinary high schooler if I was royalty. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, if you did get reincarnated by into an ordinary high schooler, you probably did something in your past life to deserve that, right? Isn't that how karma works? It's like your your station in your next life. It depends on your actions in this life. Um, you know, it's your typical like guilting people into doing the right thing to like in return for like rewards after death type of thing. But yeah, I mean. I wonder if the guard also got reincarnated or if they're just like there as a demon trying to like make this, trying to like Cyrano this like ordinary high schooler. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm curious too. Yeah. Also, spending 250 years in servitude after being murdered, that's a raw deal. Yeah. This is not a, this is not a fair afterlife. Not good times. I would like to speak to the manager. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the Asian afterlife is pretty bureaucratic so he probably is yeah. a manager <laughs> yeah. um yeah our next deal Faywell and friends acquired adoration by june her in a six-figure two-book deal this jane austen homage set during the chosan dynasty follows a young woman transcribing forbidden books and an aloof wealthy young man hiding his own literary secret who must wrestle with questions of class respectability and carving out one's own destiny when a literary censor at the Ministry of Justice uncovers her secret and their connection. Publication is slated for spring 2026. Okay, so June Her announced this book deal on her Instagram with like this beautiful mood board. And <laughs> as soon as I heard that it was a Jane Austen inspired story set in Chozon Dynasty, I'm like, how is it that June Her always knows what's in my heart and <laughs> would always pick <laughs> like she she pitches like all of the books that I really want to read. Yeah, I mean, we talked to June before. We read um, a couple of her books, um, and it's just really funny that her follow up to her like Chosan Noir murder mysteries is like now I'm going to do an Austin, but still in the Chosan Dynasty. Yeah, I remember in our interview with June, um, she mentioned that like before she got into Korean historical fiction writing. Uh, she was writing like these Regency romance novels <laughs> and she was like, no one wanted them. And now she's like fused her two loves together. So I love it. Yeah. I mean, is the Chosun Dynasty a good analog to like Regency England? I don't know. Chosun Dynasty was a very, like it <laughs> spans a long period of time. Regency was like a blip in history. So mm. yeah. Yeah. But um, you know, instead of... Instead of societal, instead of like upper class noble societal norms, you have Confucianism, which, you know, just as oppressive to women. So, yep, yep, <laughs> we we still live with it today. I hate it. All right. Next up, Quiltry acquired at auction debut author Sophia Lee's YA rom-com Eliza from Scratch, in which an overachieving high school senior finds herself enrolled in a culinary arts class where she meets an irritating but charming rival and uses her late grandmother's recipes to discover big truths about love, grief, family and herself. Publication is slated for summer 2025. Yeah, sounds like um, sounds like a a pretty charming um and used to love hers with cooking story. And I do love a good story revolving around learning how to cook from the heart. Yeah. And, you know, we, we joke about this all the time, but like Asian recipes, they're not very accurate when it comes to <laughs> measurements. <laughs> so yeah. I wonder how it's it's going to go. Yeah. Sounds like a lot of fun. Looking forward to looking forward to seeing um, the book as it releases. Um. Next up, Union Square Kids acquired author-illustrator Pam Fong's picture book, The Clock, about the evolution of a clock and the importance of second chances. Publication is planned for fall 2025. 
So is this clock a living entity or is it like a history lesson on how clocks came to existence? Well, I think it's about a specific clock that gets like passed down from person to person. So maybe the clock has ah. its own consciousness. But I don't think it's like an all-encompassing story about the the invention of the clock. I think it's just like a clock that gets passed down. At least that's my interpretation of like yeah, this I think, one Yeah, I think sentence. you're right. It's not, it's not going to be like... <laughs> Oh, like, let's see how clocks have evolved over time from the sundial to <laughs> the water clock to yeah. the cuckoo clock or whatever. Although so. I feel like that book is out there as well. But yeah, I'm sure it <laughs> is. I actually don't know, like, when modern clocks became a thing, like what country uh, invented it eventually hmm. with like all the cogs and wheels. I'll have to like Wikipedia that later. <laughs> All right, our next book deal. Owl Kids Books bought Embroidered, a picture book by author-illustrator Farida Zaman. Inspired by the handmade blanket the author wrapped her daughter in as a baby, the story shows that the kanta is created stitch by stitch under a hot Bengali sun, embroidered by generations of women, and conveys layers of love and memories and Bengali traditions and experiences. Publication is slated for fall 2026. Yeah, so this sounds similar to the last book, The Clock, but only this time it's the journey of a blanket. I think it's really sweet that it's something that um, is handmade by generations of women before you and like how um, it's just passed on. I don't know. It's just really nice to have a tangible thing um, that's like your family history. Yeah. All right, our last book deal for this episode, Albert Whitman bought world rights to Pickling Time by Marzia Abbas and illustrated by Darshika Verma. This cumulative picture book is about a child learning how to pickle fruits and vegetables with her grandmother in India. Publication is scheduled for spring 2025. I don't know how to pickle anything. I don't know how to <laughs> ferment anything. And yet I have friends who are not Korean and are able to make kimchi. So it's nice that yeah. Kids are learning how to do this at a young age. <laughs> yeah, I love a good pickle. I also don't know. I mean, I know how to pickle, but I haven't pickled anything personally. Uh, but I mean, it's just like, you know, leaving stuff in the thing, right? For like a long time. I don't, th- I, I think there's more effort that goes in, <laughs> more steps that go into it. Um, but nowadays, we have modern fridges, we have uh, equipment to ferment a lot of things a lot faster Uh, but this sounds like it's something that happens in you know the countryside so probably a more traditional way to my kitchen right now my mother-in-law's pickling some kimchi as we speak so my parents don't even use our kimchi fridge for kimchi (laughs) they just used it use it for like extra storage space Mm. to like put in ice cream and stuff and i'm like that (laughs) does not need to be pickled or fermented why did you buy this um (laughs) But that's neither here nor there. Yeah. Uh, that's to say, pickles are cool, and it's cool that we have a picture book about them. Excited. Yep. <laughs> All right. That'll do it for our book deals for July 2023. Uh, moving on to our next segment, which is book news. And man, there's been quite a bit of news over the last few weeks. Um, a lot of bummer news, to be exact. But before we get to the bummer news, let's get to the good news that Rira wanted to share, which is... um. Rira, can you tell me how the BTS book is doing? Did you get your copy? I did get my copy. I was so furious because I hadn't gotten any uh, confirmation from Barnes & Noble. I didn't get a receipt. And <laughs> like I was just like, did my book get lost in like the computer? Do I have to go buy it in person? What if it's sold out? A lot of anxiety about it. Uh, <laughs> but I got it and I'm really excited to read it. Uh, I already have like a book discussion planned with my fellow army friends. So that's going to be fun. (laughs) But uh, this is the newest piece of news that we have in our news segment. So BTS's book, Beyond the Story, became an instant number one New York Times bestseller on the hardcover nonfiction and combined print and ebook nonfiction lists. Uh, This is allegedly the first time since uh, Chi Young Kim's translation of Please Look After Mom by Kyung Suk Chin, by Kyung Suk Chin, um, that a Korean book in translation has ever appeared on the New York Times bestseller list. It's also um, allegedly the first time a book by a Korean author has topped the list, um, according to the band's agency, Big Hit Music. Uh, so 
Yay. What <laughs> did I think it was going to be a number one New York Times bestseller? No, actually. Really? Because, because wasn't it like number one in the pre-order list like right when it was announced? Like Yeah, was... like right when it was announced. But I was like, I was just like, well, I know it's going to be, I, I know it's going to make it to the bestsellers list, but I didn't think it would debut as a number one <laughs> bestseller Um, simply because uh, there were like issues with uh, shipping, like books were not arriving on time. And of course, people were buying on sites that don't count for the New York Times. I was just like, well, like chart wise, like how is it how is it going to work? I think it's going to make it in like the top five. So I was pleasantly surprised. (laughs) Um, and congratulations to Anton Herr, who was one of the translators for this book. Um, yeah, former he, guest like, of our posted, show. Yeah, former guest on our show. He was the translator for I Want to Die But Eat Tapoki, which was a book that RM recommended. Um, but yeah, like I saw his tweet and he was like, oh my God, like I grew up looking at uh, the books that come out on the New York Times bestsellers list. So it's like <laughs> nice that like a work that I worked on is finally on that list. Um but yeah, I, I was like really surprised that this was the first time that like a Korean book in translation like appeared on the bestsellers list um, since uh, Please Look After Mom. Because I feel like I've been seeing more translated, uh, more translated books from Korea uh, getting it, getting like popular, but I guess they never made it onto the list. And that just depends on like distribution, you know, like. Yeah, I mean, I was surprised to see I saw a bunch of copies at the our local bookstore because um, I, I was assuming like these books would just be bought like the moment like on site. <laughs> but then if you think about it, everyone who wanted this book probably pre-ordered it, right? Oh, yeah, 100 <laughs> percent. Like we were worried that pre-orders were going to run out and they did at a certain point. It was <laughs> quite exciting. But at the same time, like I, I'm kind of jealous of the people who got the Korean version because it came with photo cards, oh. and I'm like, why did why did the Americans not get the photo cards? Not that I'm a big photo card person, but if they're going to offer it as part of the package, I expect the goods. I expect the thing that the company <laughs> promised me. So. Um, but I'm really excited to read this book. Um, if you guys are already reading it or have already read it and you're a part of our Discord, please share your thoughts there. I'm like really excited to dig into it. Yeah. Yeah. Congrats to BTS, Anton, and everyone involved. Um, it's always cool to see, like, you know, even though I'm not personally a BTS, you know, super fan, it is cool to see when Asians win. So um go Asians I guess um okay moving on to less awesome news um the Yumi bookstore in New York which is the first um it's the first right the first all Asian American owned Asian literature focused bookstore um it is the first bookstore owned by a an Asian American woman that caters to Asian American literature yeah it's a really cool small little store I actually visited it uh when I went to New York um a month ago um, left some books and mobile bookmarks there as well um, so it was really sad to learn that it's going to be closed for the next year because of a fire that broke out in a i guess apartment above the bookstore that resulted in the bookstore itself being flooded yeah so the fire happened on july 4th unsurprisingly that's when uh, the fire departments get very busy because people are using fireworks. And I'm guessing this is how the fire happened above the bookstore. Um, and I read an article where Lucy said um, like her, like she was in the store when the fire happened. Uh, there were customers there. They smelled the smoke. And then all of a sudden, you know, chaos, everybody left. And once the fire department came, um, there were plumes of smoke upstairs and they broke through the bookstore's windows and when they went in it was already like flooded with water from the apartments upstairs so it like it was like a true bummer because uh this has been a safe place for um people who live in chinatown people who are in the asian american writing community in new york a lot of like uh A lot of cool events have been held there and uh, we just lost that place and we don't know when it's going to be fixed. Roughly a a year 
Uh, but Lucy put up a crowdfunder and uh, it raised 349198 as of right now. Uh, double their goal and a bunch of Asian American writers donated like Min Jin Lee, Celeste Ng, um, Ocean Vong. So an outpouring support for this bookstore, which is nice, but also terrible that this bookstore is closed for the time being. Yeah. And I'm glad that they were able to raise their goal and beyond. It will definitely help them because I'm sure they'll get insurance money for the fire damage but then you know to be able to support their staff to replenish their stock and to you know have a have a safety fund for future you know costs because it's probably not gonna be cheap to rebuild that store and insurance being the labyrinth the bureaucratic labyrinth that it is who knows when they'll actually see the insurance money so so to have cash on hand to help with the repairs and stuff i think you know it's it's good to see that the, the community came out in support of this bookstore and are like proof that bookstores like this really are like the heart of or a heart of the community and you know mission-based businesses can overcome challenges like this because you know for many businesses like this type of thing is like it's a death knell right like there's no recovery from it so it's really cool to see the community come out and support you and me yeah according to lucy uh insurance money is probably not going to come in until like eight months later and, you know, during that time, you could be rebuilding the store. So having this money on hand definitely helps. It's going to go into um, their staff's wages and in, uh, and their health insurance so that they actually have jobs to go back to, <laughs> which is really nice. Um, but, yeah. yeah, like if you want to donate, we'll add a link to the crowdfunder um, in the show notes and also on Twitter. Yeah. Okay, so now on to the... Even more I, bummer I guess, news. Right? Even more bummer news, which happened yesterday. It's really funny because we were supposed to record this episode yesterday. And, um, you know, I had told Marvin, I was like, oh, I'm still reading a book that um, we need to read for like an assignment. So I don't think I can do the news episode. And literally an hour after I said that, this news happened. So HarperCollins slash Harlequin, they are shutting down Inkyard Press, which is um, a YA and middle grade imprint that that is very well known for having diverse books. Um, And the staff were notified via mass email from Harper that, you know, they're going to lose their jobs and that their last day is August 1st, which is not that far away. Um, and the books that are still in production will be moved to other Harper imprints. However, according to um, a lot of the Inkyard Press authors, they haven't gotten any additional information on where their books will possibly go. Um, they're not going to obviously have the same editors, so that's a bummer as well. And uh, Harper said in a statement, Current market conditions have posed a variety of challenges for the business, which has been acutely felt in the YA middle grade space with a shifting retail landscape, reduced distribution and higher production costs in a price sensitive segment. And I say bull fucking shit to this (laughs) because um, like. I, like, I just hate the fact that they went for the salaries first. They didn't even think about other innovative ways to um, sell books. And the fact that Barnes & Noble has dramatically decreased the stock that they're getting for uh, newer YA children's book titles. Like, of course, they're not going to get the sales that they want. And uh, this is really a big bummer because uh, Penguin Random House, they shut down Razorbill earlier this year. And um, with layoffs happening, there's like less editors. So they're already overworked. Where are these books going to go? Like, will they have time? Will they have the energy to even like put in the work to uh, edit these books? So it's, yeah, yeah, it's really heartbreaking. And they deserve to know better than, like, a fucking mass email. Like, have we learned nothing from, like, COVID? I mean, you're expecting corporations to act like people, which they have shown no, time and time again not. that they do not. And, you know, we've – the sad part is, like you mentioned, Inkyard Press is one of the most more diverse imprints under the HarperCollins umbrella. And 
it's really troubling to see that there seems to be a trend that anytime these media companies do cost cutting, the first teams, the first division, the first departments to be cut seem to be the diverse ones or the ones that uh, focus on diverse content. And corporations like to hide their um, cost-cutting decisions based on what the data bore out, which in itself can be mired and tainted with institutionalized bias. But the truth is, like, the money to save your operations, to, like, keep your company afloat is there if you just look. And like Reaver said, like, your first line of defense shouldn't be to cut your operational workforce. I think much like the actors and writers strike right now going on in Hollywood – the money needed to support the day-to-day operations is like a drop in the bucket for any of these executives. Like, I feel like if they really did care about supporting the companies that they they purportedly work for, like taking a one to two percent pay cut to like redistribute those resources to um, your operations is not that much to ask when you're already making like millions of dollars a year. I feel okay. So like, there's a lot of factors that go into this obviously and i'm not a publishing professional but like from what i have heard um publishers are gutting paperbacks and i'm like are you fucking kidding me like most people buy paperbacks that's how they get books so you're eliminating a large amount of sales already like you're thinking that releasing a hardcover that has you know that has a high price will give you like higher return. But I'm like, if less people are buying hardcovers and also it's more expensive to produce hardcovers, then that doesn't make sense. I think they should probably release paperbacks first. And then if the sales do really well, then come out with a hardcover for the fans who really want like a more like sturdier version of of their favorite book. And also, like you said, like reducing the executive salaries and channeling that into um, editors and yeah. uh, publicists' salaries. That would definitely help. And it also fucking sucks because Harper Collins had a strike. Like they just negotiated and came to an agreement with their union. And now they're getting rid of an imprint. They're firing a bunch of people. The layoffs are still happening. Other publishing houses are laying off their. Their staff. And like Marvin said, it's always the diverse uh, imprints, the diverse teams that are getting gutted first. And we're also seeing this in journalism. um, And it's not even just like diverse um, teams, it's just like women led teams, women magazines. And it's like, okay, well, clearly the corporation, like, it's run by people who are very out of touch who thinks that the main audience and the main money is coming from white, cis, straight men. Yeah, I mean, in business school, we're taught that there are two ways to increase profit, right? One way is to create new revenue streams, which involve like expanding product offerings or developing brand new products. And the other is to cut costs, find more efficient ways to do business. And what we've seen is when corporations are running against like not reaching profit, Um, objectives, their first instinct is to cut. And their first instinct isn't to cut like inefficiencies up top in the C-suite. It's to cut costs at the easiest place you can cut it, which is the workers, like the ground level workers who are putting in work and actually need the money to like survive. And combine that with the fact that corporations are inherently conservative. They hate risk. The whole point is to reduce risk. And so when they're faced with a decision, they will default to the least riskiest, at least in their eyes, strategy there is. And that's just so funny to me because data shows that most readers are women. (laughs) So I'm just like, like, do you, obviously they don't look at the data, like the real data, and uh, they have no idea what they're doing up there. (laughs) Um, And like I I said, with like Barnes and Noble and a lot of like, bookstores like reducing stock on new releases it's it's really gutting on you know it's there so like barnes and noble and bookstores uh cutting down on uh new releases that they receive like that like that is really harmful to authors who are doing uh book launch events at these bookstores like i've heard stories of authors who 
uh, had a book launch at Barnes & Noble, and it turns out they only have 10 copies of their book. And I'm like, what? This is your launch. They should have at least 25 copies minimum. And this is me saying this as someone who worked at a bookstore and primarily like um, book launch events. So it's it's just really, really sad. And um, I don't know, like this is not a sustainable way to keep the industry going. You have people who are quiet quitting. You have people who are overworked and um, Inkyard, they release like four to six books a month. And now that number is gone. So less yeah. diverse books coming out and publishing that way. So I know we're not exactly members of the publishing industry, but I'm curious as like a someone who used to work as a bookseller, what do you think the solutions are to this dilemma? Yeah, I like I honestly don't know the solution cuz like Marvin said we're not professionals in the industry, we only cover it and obviously there are things that we don't understand about uh putting out a book in the world, like we're not um we're not experts on it, but my concern is that the books that do get absorbed um, are probably going to go to Harper Teen because uh, that is like the teen imprint. And um, I'm guessing that's like the easiest way to transfer the Inkyard books because they're within the same company. Um, but I feel like that's going to cut down on a lot of marketing budgets on these diverse books. And that means that they're going to get less promotion and less promotion means less sales. So it's it's not a solution to just move these books into other imprints within Harper. Um, and I personally really think that uh, independent publishers have a better understanding on how to market these types of books. So personally, I think the future is in independent publishing, but that's not going to, but with like, big publishing companies like buying off imprints and then just getting rid of them after two, three years. Like it's, um, it's, it's difficult to predict and it's difficult to say like, what is the solution? Um, I know like there was data on, on like how much authors receive royalty when it comes to audiobooks and eBooks and uh, paperbacks versus hardbacks. Um, I know that buying hardbacks is the best way to support them. And then like the second best way is to buy audiobooks because they get a bigger percentage. I'm don't quote me on this. I'm I'm guessing that this is what it is, um, depending on like I'm guessing that this is what the case is from what I have seen on Twitter in the in, in the past. But um yeah, like pre-order books and I guess, like, promote as much as you can as, like, a book lover. Like, if you love a book, go on Goodreads, write reviews. This is the way that um, writers with less marketing budgets will get a leg up. But overall, as, like, an industry solution, I don't have one. I just don't. Yeah. All right. Well, hearts go out to all the editors and all the people who lost their jobs over at Inkyard and all the authors who whose books are now thrown into into chaos essentially um hopefully everyone lands on their feet um i know there's a lot of support going on in the online circles which you know used to be twitter but now twitter is imploding too so um yeah i guess moving on to bummer news that's more close to home um Rira, what is going on with the asian american literature festival uh, so the Smithsonian abruptly canceled the 2023 Asian American Literature Festival. Um, this happened on July 5th. So literally one month ahead of the festival. The festival was scheduled for August 4th to the 6th. And the partners received a curt email from the acting director, Yao Fen Yu, saying that the festival had been canceled due to, quote, uh, that the festival had been canceled, in quotes, due to unforeseen circumstances. And the Washington Post uh, reported on this abrupt cancellation and some red flags were raised. <laughs> um, so pretty much the Smithsonian, they alleged that the festival organiz that the festival organizers were unable to prepare uh, the confirmed materials for the review of the program. And uh, 
the Asian American Literature Festival were, were just like, no, we sent everything ahead of time. We sent our full schedule of programs on May 3rd. Um, they also like sent in an additional requested report on um, their current programming on July 5th, which was the same day. It got <laughs> nixed. So um, there's an open letter from the org- from the festival organizers to the Smithsonian. It's on it's on Google Drive. And um, a ton of people have signed it already, but it's a pretty big deal considering that this is a festival that is so unique and has like so many nonprofits tied to it. Yeah, I mean, it's a festival that I've wanted to eventually attend at some point. Like it started after I left D.C., but it's like a collaboration between Smithsonian APAC, uh, Library of Congress and Kundiman, who is like a, a pretty... Um, prolific um, organization in the world of like Asian American literary arts. So it was really like, yeah, a bummer to see that it was canceled, first of all. And also learning more about like the situation surrounding cancellation. Like I've done big events like this before. And like, you know, canceling it a month in advance because of like unforeseen difficulties. That's like something like we did that because of COVID back in 2020 for, for my events. But that was because like there was a lockdown happening there was no way this event was going on the fact that like the the statement from the smithsonian so wildly diverges from the people that worked on the event like the organizers and also like the specific contractors brought in to like project manage this event it's very suspicious right and there's a lot of speculations on the exact reasons or reasons that led to the, the cancellation and a lot of them veer into the political realm too right like when i heard about the the decision um, and like the timing of it, right? Like weeks following the um, Supreme Court striking down for action, for example, it just screams like policy change to me, right? Like something um, trickling down from up top that um, gave justification for canceling this event that probably rubbed some people the wrong way or something. Like those are the vibes that I got. And to be honest, what's been coming out about the cancellation from the open letter and from the reporting um, kind of supports that, right? Yeah. And in the open letter, the Asian American Literary Festival, they said that um, a driving factor behind the cancellation might have been the Smithsonian desire to censor trans and non-binary programming because they did have programs uh, listed in their report, which they sent out on July 5th. And again, that's when the festival was canceled. So they're assuming that um, that may have been a trigger. Also, like Change the Museum, um, they've said that the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center has an interim director who yells at staff and gets drunk in public and says racist things, um, which is not great for leadership. Um, The museum has received 50 to 60 percent of staff complaints and nothing is being done. So um, this is more than just politics and optics there's something going on there there's something rotten going on in the museum yeah as of this recording the museum has not given an official statement yet besides some very basic neutral language and that sucks because a lot of people have been affected by this including a lot of like organizations that were really relying on this festival for for their programming and operations One thing that sucks especially is that New Zealand and Australia, they approved a bunch of visas for the uh, participants for this festival. So there's like there's thousands of dollars that went into visa and lodging and there was supposed to be a 10 day retreat for upcoming writers. And that's gone. They're not being reimbursed at all. So uh, this festival is losing money and... (sighs) They didn't even get to hold it. So that sucks. Yeah. Hopefully they'll be able to hold it um, in a different venue with a different partner. I'm just crossing my fingers. Yeah, the whole the whole situation stinks and the timing is very suspect. And there's just a lot of like there's a lot of. It's it's just very it's it's very stinky. It's a very stinky situation, and I, I my heart goes out as an event organizer to all of the 
the planners of this event because like putting on something at this scale is not easy. It takes a lot of planning meetings, a lot of scheduling, and it seems like they were pretty much good to go. And so to have like months of work pulled out from under you, in addition to not being able to support like Asian and Asian American literature, especially in like this time when so many like again bummer things are happening all over, it's it sucks. Um, and and we do hope that that the festival lands on its feet, but it's it's not in a good position right now, for sure. Yeah, and the last festival that they held was back in 2019. So yeah. it's been a number of years. People were very excited to attend this festival. So yeah. extra bummer. But that is it for our news segment. Sorry for ending it on a downer, but it has been a downer week and hopefully uh, no more downer news for... The rest of July, but we can only hope. Yeah. All right. Um, I guess before we call it an episode, um, Riri, can you remind us what we are reading for the month of July? We are reading The Imaginary Lives of James Ponike by Tina Maccaretti, and it is a historical fiction novel set in uh, Victorian London. A Maori teenager travels there to take part in an exhibition and discovers a whole new world <laughs> and sees how bad colonialism is. Um, we'll be discussing that book at the end of the month. Um, as always, if you finish the book, please let us know your thoughts on Goodreads or on our Discord server, um, which you can have access to if you are a Patreon subscriber. Um, again, our Patreon to support the podcast can be found at patreon.com slash books and boba. And with that, thanks for listening to our July Mint Month Check-In. Um, we'll see you next time. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks for listening to Books and Boba. This podcast was hosted by Marvin Yue and Ri Ryu and edited and produced by Marvin Yue. Follow the book club on Twitter and Instagram by going to at Books and Boba and engage with us on Goodreads on our Goodreads group. You can also check out past episodes of the podcast by going to booksandboba.com and by subscribing to us on your favorite podcast app. Don't forget, you can support Books and Boba and Asian American authors by purchasing books at our bookshop.org account. Check out the link in our show notes and also at booksandboba.com. Books and Boba is a proud member of the Potluck Podcast Collective, a collective of Asian American hosted podcasts featuring unique voices and stories from the Asian diaspora. Learn more about the collective and check out our fellow Potluck shows by visiting the website podcastpotluck.com. Thanks for listening. Life gets a little crazy sometimes. Sometimes it's confusing, sometimes it's funny, sometimes it's beautiful, and sometimes it can just piss us off. Enter First of All Podcast. It's a safe space for real conversations about the things that we all struggle with, celebrate, contemplate, and work through in our daily lives. I'm your host, Mindy Chang. I'm an actor, filmmaker, and entrepreneur with a colorful background, a full life, and brilliant friends who I love to unpack life with to share with all of you. They are everyday people like you and me, ranging from award-winning artists, cultural icons, powerful CEOs, my hilarious childhood friends, and even my mom. Tune in for honest conversations on mental health, dating, sex, family, career, culture, and everything in between. Listen to First of All wherever you find podcasts. Part of the Potluck Podcast Collective.